right. So Shabbat Shalom, everybody. And uh, we're happy to be back. We had a good time over there in Florida, but we are happy to be home. In our, and you always sleep better in your own bed. All right, so um, today I'm um, going over the Lessons in Leadership by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And uh, this week, it's um, for a portion of Shof Team. And, with, and the title of this chapter is called Learning and Leadership. We've kind of went over this a little bit before um, and about, about learning, about how leaders need to um, need to learn or uh, more like how leaders need to be teachers, right? But um, this time um, he talks a little bit more about how leaders need to actually be learners too. Um, so um, in the beginning, he talks about how, you know, our sages, they teach, um, they teach about the three crowns, um, um, the, the three crowns of leadership, priesthood, kingship, and Torah. Um, these are the three um, you know, I don't know, three parts of leadership in a way, or how, how it's split. Um, and, um, you know, we've kind of, we, in, in our country, we've kind of, we've kind of implemented this in, in a sense, how we, um, split up, um, uh, church and state type of thing, you know, where we have our religious, um, religion shouldn't be part of our, I mean, not, I mean, not, it's kind of, it kind of leads us, but there's like the separation of church and state, right? And so um, that, that kind of it actually has come from um, Torah, from the Bible, and from, from Judaism in a way. Um, but he talks about how, you know, we have these three powers. We have the, the, the king who is like a secular power. We have the, um, the priest who is like a, the religious power who leads the religious things. And... Um, and then you have the prophet who kind of uh, corrects these other two powers in a sense, tells them what they're doing wrong, what, you know, what they're doing right. And, um, and a lot of times you think of a prophet as someone who predicts, predicts like what's going to happen in the future. But uh, more often than not, they're more like calling you out on what you're doing wrong. You know what I'm saying? That's really what happens. <laughs> right. And so um, anyway, <clears throat> so the judges, exactly. So uh, catching. Okay. So the most attention attention catching part in, in this section of the parsha is about the section on kings. Um, first, it talks about how the king. Um, for, the first thing that kind of catches your eye is about how the king has to carry the Torah all the time. He has to actually write his own Torah and carry it with him all the time, right? And continue to learn from it. Um, um, and and um, it's interesting how you know it says you are going to have a king like all the other nations. And normally, you know, um, everywhere else, it's telling us to be different, different than the other nations. But in this, in this thing, I guess it's kind of a common, I guess Hashem is saying, you know, we, you're going to need a king eventually. You're going to want a king, you know, and you know, the sages kind of break it down. Sometimes some, some sages say it's a good thing. Some say it's a bad thing. Some say it was a curse to us. Some say it was like, it was a needed thing. So I don't know. is there different opinions about that? Um, um, the second thing that kind of jumps out at us um, is that this passage is negative. Instead of it telling the, saying what the king should do, or, or you know, it's telling the telling us what the king shouldn't do. You know, it gives like three things that the king should not do. You know, when we went over these last night with the kids, um, they shouldn't have too many um, horses, shouldn't have too many wives, and shouldn't have too much money or gold. Um, and so. It's like these, and then it even gives exam, it gives reasons why. Well, it doesn't give reasons why the, the wives, because that's obvious, I think. But it gives reasons why the horses, because I'm you know, thinking, like, why can't he have king have a lot of horses? But he says because they'll go back to Egypt. That's kind of surprising. All right. <clears throat> um, and the third thing um, is um, is consistent with the fundamental Judaic idea that leadership is service, not dominion or power or status or superiority. The king is commanded to be humble. He must constantly read the Torah so that he may learn to revere the Lord, his God, 
and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites. So, um, you know, just to be learning, continually learning from your Torah, uh, which will make uh, a person humble, I feel. Um, and then um, he also teaches um, that, you know, we are like, we are the children of the book. So our leaders also need to be um, people who study the Torah and study the word and, and continue to, to learn. He gave, he gave a lot of secular, not a lot, but he gave some secular examples of leaders who, um, who like read a lot, you know? So there's one um, Gladstone, the prime minister of Britain, he said his library had 32,000 um, books and he, and, he, and he had a, he had a diary and he noted that he read 22,000 of those 32,000 books. So that's pretty impressive. They said he read about, to do that, to, 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 and in his lifespan, it said he had to read about five books a week, you know, throughout his life. Um, that's, that's like five more books than I read per week. So I better start step up my game a little bit, right? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I might read like a half, like a quarter of a book or something. Um, and then he also talked about um, Ben Gurion, um, um, you know, Israel, Israel, one of the founders of Israel, are getting it back established again. And um, he also had um, a very humble home in a sense, but he also had a vast library of 22,000 books. Um, and then he had another um, 4,000, I guess, in his, in his little um, office or something like that. Um, and it also says, um, you know, Churchill was another example he gave where that has that has written a lot of books. He wrote, he wrote like 50 books. He had a Nobel Prize for literature. Um, so he, he, he liked to say like, what separates a, a statesman from a, from a mere politician is, is you're a reader and a, and a writer. You, know, you, you are um, very involved in, in your learning and things. Um, and then it also talks about the two greatest kings of Israel, which is um, David and Solomon. And both of them were authors of, of, of these books, you know, right? We have Psalms for, from David and, um, and, and Shlomo, he wrote, you know, I mean, he's supposed to be a, wrote, written the Song of Songs, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, you know. And, you know, this is, you know, associated with this hokma or wisdom. I mean, and, and you know, Solomon was known to be the most wisest king of all and he was also seemed like the most literate king the most um, learned learned king in a way um it talks about how solomon's great wisdom and also how people uh, and other other leaders of other nations would come to visit him to learn from him and to see his wisdom talked about how queen of sheba you know praised him until said you know i would wouldn't have believed i was told about this but i wouldn't have i really believed it when, until i saw it with my own eyes and, and it's not even as as much as what people have said, you know, it's even more, it's like double of what they said. Um, but um, this wisdom is, 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 is above just mere um, worldly wisdom. It's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a spiritual aspect to, to the wisdom that we can learn from the Torah. I mean, science can explain certain things, but you know, when, when you have um, Hashem and his Torah, connecting it, it makes even more, um, it makes more sense and, and you can be a better leader by applying that, you know. So um, wisdom without Torah is not enough to save a leader from the corruptions of power. So leaders learn, they read, and they study. So this is what we must also do. We must learn and read and study and, and, get, and just be aware, you know, aim, like I, this isn't in the book, but I know like Schneerson, um, he didn't encourage people to go into, into to like college until after they have studied the, the Torah for a certain number of years. But he himself st studied worldly things just to be familiar with it so that he would know what people were talking about and how he'd be able to input you know, things and know what's going on in, in the round. So, you know, it's very, um, he was a very wise, see, he doesn't go out with him. 
So we must study both wisdom and, and the Torah to connect them together. Um, and I'll just close with this final um, sentence. Um, leaders should never stop learning. That is how they grow and teach others to grow with them. So let us continue to learn, continue, continue to grow, and help others around us to grow with us. All right, that's all I got. <laughs> and now Menashe can come up and give us his little talk. Okay. All right. Goodbye, shalom. Goodbye, shalom. All right. So, in this uh, in this week's Torah portion, in Deuteronomy twenty verse eight, it's, there's a couple things that stood out to me. Mainly, the whole passage on if uh, like if you had built a home recently, or if you had a vineyard, or if you were going to get married, then return. So I found it very interesting, and it goes on to list. Uh, one second. Um, yeah. So it lists, lists all these things, and then it lastly lists if anybody is afraid of disheartened, return so that you may not dishearten your fellow like soldiers in the fight. So there are a couple of overarching things, but I just want to go over them to uh, like every single thing to um, by itself, and then at the end go over them together. So it starts with saying the official side will address the troops as follows: If there's anyone who's built the house and has not dedicated it, let it go, let him go back to his home, lest he die in battle and another one dedicated for him. Moving out is a big deal, especially like here. Um, in our culture now, where like it, you're supposed to like get out at 18 and build your own life kind of thing. And moving out is already a big deal, but building your own home is normally something like that's like monumental in somebody's life. That like that's a big landmark, your first home or building your first home. So um in my but in my opinion, that would be something that could like cause you to uh, it would be on your mind the entire time you're in battle if like you just built this home. You would like to go back to it to be able to dedicate it so that's why it tells you if you've already if you've done this then go back so that this may not be on your mind and then the people that are in battle can focus like on being in battle and not on things that could possibly be going on at back at their house mm -hmm. the next one is if there's anybody who's planting a vineyard but has never harvested it let him go back to his home another big step is have is finding a way to feed yourself or to provide for yourself so the in back in the Israelites' times, it would have been a vineyard, but maybe in our time, it would be like creating your own business. So, like if you've created your own business, but you've never heart, um, like profited from it or like had like a big landmark on it, then go back and um, harvest it, kind of thing. So, like they would go back and make sure that they could um, have something to provide for themselves, because this is all building up to the last one, which is if there's anyone who's paid the bride price for a wife. But has not married her, let him go back to his home, lest he not die in battle and another one marry her. So you first set up your home, then you set up a way to provide for yourself, and then you get married. And um, these are all things that would be on your mind. So then you to go back to so then when you're fighting, it's only you're, the only thing is on your mind is fighting. But all these, uh, I think all these three steps are important because it's kind of like showing you like the, the way you do things is you set up a home, then you set up a way to provide for yourself, and then you find you go and find a wife. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, so like I said, you set up your entire life and then hopefully find somebody to share it with. And going into battle, you're acknowledging and preferably going out into a high risk environment and address dying in battle as going before your time. So that's why when King David had uh, had the general go into battle and say, basically saying he shall go down into battle and be swept away. So yeah, that was my commentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Shalom. So I wanted to begin with some comments regarding last week's parasha and uh, then link them to this week's parasha. And I was thinking about Alex and Marco this week, actually, as they were having fun out on the beach and I was suffering here in the heat. I was thinking about them because I was thinking about their adventures that are coming up. You know, they're moving on to another stage of life. Uh, and it was, you know, I, I thought about that. So I wanted to sort of speak on that and then, again, relate it to this week's parasha. Um, Basic classes in philosophy at the college level or high school level usually start off with the story of al the, uh, the allegory of Plato's cave. Marco, I'm sure, remembers that. And in, in the story, or in the allegory, they, um, there are slaves that are imprisoned in a cave. And they're put in such a way that they cannot turn their heads. They can only look at the, at the wall. Um, and as a consequence, there's a fire behind them. And as the master and his servants sort of pass by, they cast shadows on the wall. And these individuals, because of their slavery, uh, they think that the, the, you know, when they hear sounds, they believe that the shadows speak. Uh, one day, one of them escapes, one of the prisoners escapes and goes outside. And of course, the first thing that happens is his eyes are overwhelmed by the sun, right? Temporary blind blindness. Uh, but if you think about it, this is the first time that this individual is able to differentiate between freedom and slavery between light and darkness and between all these differences, right? It, it takes that personal experience to be able to, to uh, understand these uh, things. And then as he goes back and tries to tell his, uh, you know, fellow former slaves or uh, slaves, you know, that he runs into the problem of trying to communicate these ideas because they have no idea what he's talking about. Now, at the beginning of last week's parasha, Moshe Rabbeinu begins the portion with uh, Re'e, Si Anochi Noten Lifnechem Chayom, Bracha uklala, see, I set before you today uh, the blessing and the curse. And Rabbi Chaim Kadosh uh, asked the question, who does Moshe Rabbeinu think he is to say, I set before you the blessing and the curse? Because normally, of course, we read, Moshe Lemor, Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, right? But this is Moshe Rabbeinu saying, I set before you the blessing and the curse. And then Ram, uh, Ram, uh, Rabbi uh, Chaim Kadosh says, I'll tell you who he is. This is the individual who was a prince of Egypt. This is an individual who was in Pharaoh's palace and lived as uh, in the midst of the, the, law, the learning, the science, the magic, the religion, the decadence, everything that you can imagine, Moshe Rabbeinu was uh, informed about or potentially even experienced. So when he says, I set before you life and blessing, he knows what he's talking about. Why? Because what he's saying is his encounter at Sinai, his encounter with the burning bush where Hashem reveals himself is no comparison to all the things that he has experienced in Egypt. And I think that's very important. Now, it's interesting how all these things sort of connect. Uh, you know, Reuben talked about how Rabbi Schneerson knew many things. There's a story about Rabbi uh, Schmilke of Nicholsburg, very, very famous Hasidic Rebbe, he was invited uh, to a new congregation, um, and his first drash was on, uh, he, you know, they called him up, and he started talking about literature. And then the next, next week, he was talking about mathematics, and then the next week was philosophy and science. And everybody was confused, right, because this is a great Hasidic Rebbe, and he was talking about things that didn't make any sense. And then eventually, he started to talk about the parasha, or the parashiot. And they said, oh, Rabbi, that was wonderful, but we're a little bit confused. You know, we really enjoyed it. But you talked about, you know, for weeks, you talked about all these other subjects. Well, why did you do that? And he says, well, because if I had come to you and only talked about the Torah, he would say, well, that's, of course, what is he, is he going to talk about, right? That's all he knows. He's a rabbi. But he said, but I talked to you about literature and music and science and philosophy. I showed you that I had experienced the world and the things that are out there. And so I could bring them to you. And now you can see that I'm a little bit more well-rounded as an individual. And then I'll say one more thing about last week's parasha, and then we'll sort of switch. Uh, you know, the task before us is to draw the blessing from the curse. Uh, Rabbi uh, Moshe ben Nachman, uh, uh, Nachmanides, uh, or the Ramban, uh, as you know, was, was one of the greatest Spanish rabbis. And he was involved with the famous disputation at Barcelona. In 1263, he was debating Pablo Cristiani, a, a, a Jew who had uh, apostatized and become a, a Catholic. Uh, and he was very good at debating. And uh, the, the church was very upset about that because, of course, Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Nachman was licking, making them look bad. 
Now, at the same time, they had to be careful, according to the story that uh, Rabbi Baruch Gelman relates, uh, they had to be careful, of course, politically, because they didn't want to see, they didn't want to seem like they were setting up the whole thing. So they said, you know, we need to eliminate Rabbi Nachman because he's making us look bad. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, uh, we're going to take two pieces of paper and we're going to write uh, death and death instead of life and death, right? Then he gets to pick the, the, the paper and then we'll say, well, you know, that's divine judgment. You know, you picked it. So Rabbi Nachman, you know, knowing sort of where they were going with this is they present him the paper. And what he does is he takes the paper and he eats it. And they're like, why did you do that? He goes, well, you just have to look at the other paper and you'll see that it's the opposite of what you had. And so what is the point of that? Uh, obviously a little humor, but it's to show that out of curse, out of the curse, he's able to draw the blessing. So Moshe Rabbeinu was able to draw from his experiences in Egypt as a prince of Egypt, as a general, as the Midrash says, how do we know that? Because we see it in the Torah, right? He tells the people of Israel, you know, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, choose this. This is, the, this is the understanding of a general, somebody who knows leadership, all these different things that he learned, and he extracts this, and he turns it into the service of Hashem. Now, in this week's parsha, we have something interesting. We have the prohibition of a matseva. Uh, the matseva is a pillar, a rock. Uh, and generally, in, in ancient Near Eastern societies, what would happen is you would set up a matseva, you would consecrate it with oil or something of that nature, and then in the minds of the, you know, the Canaanites and, and different uh, Near Eastern societies, the God that they were dedicating this to would inhabit the Matseva. And we see this, in fact, in the book of Genesis, right? We see that Jacob is doing this. It's very clear. Uh, but the Torah now prohibits this. And we can talk about why it's okay with Jacob does it. That's a sort of a separate subject. But I would say this, that culture is the only context for truth. So at the time that Jacob does this, this is acceptable because the Torah has not been given, right? So he is doing something that he understands to invoke, invoke the name of Hashem. Uh, so this is important. Now, the Torah does permit the construction of a Mizbeach. A Mizbeach is an altar. And, you know, one of the clearest signs or one of the clearest examples that we see is the case of Eliyahu Hanavi, uh, Elijah the prophet, when he constructs the Mizbeach. And what does he do? He takes 12 stones and he puts them together. And so what Rabbi David Silberberg points out to us is, is the, the contrast between the Matseva and the Mizbeach. The Matseva is one stone. The Mizbeach is 12, one for each of the tribes in the, in the case of Eliyahu Hanavi. And what does this tell us? It tells us that an individual by themselves cannot stand. Not according to the Torah. You can also find it in the New Testament. Do not forsake the assembly of, of believers, I believe it says. Uh, this is something critical in our day and age because our society uh, is very focused in on individualism, uh, on the personal experience. Uh, and we, in the midst of this pandemic, you know, whatever, however you want to consider it, uh, has only intensified these issues of separation. We've seen it practically because of reduced numbers, you know, locally, but we see this across, right? People are separated out of concern, out of fear, many different reasons. And so what this causes is the individual to sort of rely on their natural tendencies to only be concerned about themselves. Uh, and as an, two individuals, young individuals going out to the world, this is very challenging. Because the reason that Moshe Rabbeinu could say, you know, relate this wisdom is because he had undergone these things. So obviously on a practical level, your parents have experienced things in their lives that all of us you know, should listen to because they have experience. But at the same time, we have to remember that we cannot exist individually. We need a community, or if we don't have one, we better start it. We better connect to others because they're the only ones that will provide us with that balance in our lives and that judgment that is necessary. We talked about the shofet, right? You go to the shofet in your day if there is a matter that you do not know. And you cannot do that unless there is a community that is built to facilitate those different elements. And so this is critical. And this is why I always say, and I've said it as probably as long as you've known me, Judaism is not lone, the Lone Ranger. It's not Lone Ranger Judaism. This is a community, it's a collective. People have to be part of it. They have to build the bricks that are necessary for the Mizbeach, or else they will do what is right in their own eyes. And this is the tragedy uh, that we face in our day and age, right? Everybody wants to do what's right in their own eyes, so their own morality is whatever they believe it is. 
whatever a man is or whatever a woman is, is what they themselves feel it to be. But we don't have that uh, opportunity or that we, we, we have the Torah. We have guidelines that we have to follow and it can only be followed in the context of a community. So as you go out into the world, remember, this is the time of exploration and discovery and it's a, it's a wonderful time, but you have to remember the things that have been set before you and then you also have to link with the people or create those links to give you the stability to make the best use of the, the opportunities that Hashem uh, sets before you. So uh, may Hashem, as we enter into the, uh, the period, of course, we're in Elul, uh, we're getting you know, fast into the, to, uh, Tishrei soon. May Hashem give us the opportunity to build the relationships that we need uh, and to make Teshuvah uh, for the sake of ourselves and for the sake of, of all Israel.